Oh, we thank you for your word. It is, it is food to our hearts. And God, we pray that you will teach us your word and help us to get to, to know you better because you show us your heart through your word. We depend on your spirit. We depend on your gift. In the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, so sharing screen and moving. Uh, I'm actually skipping a section on uh, ritual purity in Mark chapter 7, verses 1 to 23. It's a really interesting section, but uh, I'm trying to stick more with the narrative since it's probably easier to follow. But anyway, um, Jesus goes away outside of Galilee. He goes into Gentile territory. Now, there were Gentiles in parts of Galilee, but he's going to specifically Gentile territory. And no, uh, even there, he doesn't find privacy. You know, he went there for the purpose of, of uh, getting his disciples to have a break, but it keeps happening to them. I mean, every time they go somewhere to get a break, people come and <laughs> swarm after him. Well, here it's not the crowds, but there is, there is somebody who, who comes. Um, now, there were Jewish people who lived near Tyre, but it was predominantly Gentile, like, like this woman who's going to come visit him. She's a uh, Syrophoenician. Um, and Phoenicians worshiped false gods, but uh, Jesus viewed Tyre and Sidon as potentially receptive. We see that elsewhere in his writings. And from the book of Acts, we see that the gospel spread there. Here you can see a, a picture of Tyre. Tyre was originally an island kingdom, but uh, Alexander the Great, when he was going by to, to conquer, the Tyrians said, ha ha, you can't conquer us. We're, we're on an island and you don't have ships. He said, that's all right. I have an army. And so they, they just brought more and more sand and they built out a land bridge to this island. And then they went in and conquered it. So Tyre now is a part of a peninsula, <laughs> but it used to be an island. And here's a, uh, here are some old pictures of what it used to look like. So a woman comes to her whose daughter is demonized. Her daughter has a spirit. And uh, later we're gonna see a father with a demonized son. So Mark provides a range of examples so we can recognize that nobody's left out. We also see an example of intercession because when people are bringing somebody else or they are making a request for somebody else, Jesus also answers those. And that's good for us to remember. She falls before Jesus, which is a gesture of respect. <clears throat> uh, sometimes it's a gesture of terror, like with the demons, uh, the demonized people falling before him. But sometimes it's a gesture of respect and entreaty, like with Jairus and uh, the woman with the flow of blood, she's showing respect after being cured. Now, the woman who comes to him here on behalf of her daughter, it says that she's Greek and she's Syrophoenician. Well, how does that work? Um, Syrophoenician tells you where she is. Uh, and she's considered that ethnically. Uh, Syrophoenicia the reason they use that designation is to distinguish it from Libophoenicia or to make things more simple. These are Phoenicians who lived in what today is Syria rather than in today what's Libya. Um, but she's culturally Greek. Ever since Alexander the Great conquered this area, he, uh, well, the people with the prestige, the, the high class people, these were the descendants from the Greek settlers and the Macedonian settlers and those who intermarried with them. So they're the high class. So she's, she's a fairly high class person, uh, more prestigious than, than average in Tyre. But she's now reduced to the point of begging, just like Jairus the synagogue leader was. So uh, she has to humble herself. Matthew calls her a Canaanite, which you know the, the Phoenicians were related to the Canaanites, so it makes sense Matthew does that. If we were discussing Matthew, I'd tell you more. But, um, but she wants deliverance for her daughter, 
And Jesus says, I'm sorry, I came for the Jewish people first. Uh, he, he, he says it a little bit more strongly than that. <laughs> he says, uh, it's not right to take the children's bread and to give it to dogs. Now, there's a lot of bread in this context. I mean, Jesus multiplies bread in chapter 6. He multiplies bread in chapter 8. But he says, this is a special privilege for my people at this point. I've come first for them. And, and when he says uh, the children's bread, of course, Israel had often been called God's children earlier in the Bible. But to call somebody a dog, well, he didn't technically call her a dog, but to compare somebody to a dog, that was kind of rude, you know, that's, that's uh, an insult, especially if you're Jewish, because for Jewish people, uh, uh, in, in Judea and Galilee anyway, dogs were considered like rats. They weren't considered pets. But uh, Greeks, however, often kept dogs as pets. And she, she says, okay, I'll take the positive meaning and, and try to make this work for my, on my behalf. And I've got a bunch of pictures of, uh, from ancient Greece where they have pet dogs um, and sometimes pet birds as well. Dog was an insult. Greek sources use it as an insult uh, when people were making war with each other, they'd say, you dog, as they were getting ready to fight. It was an insult for both males and females, and it had connotations similar to those today, sexual promiscuity, plus worthless excrements, uh, excrement sniffing uh, people, or uh, well, yeah, dogs that shoot on corpses, you know, very, very, it's very nasty when it was used as an insult. And you see that even in the Old Testament. Uh, Philistine says to David, what, you think I'm a dog? You come to me with sticks? Um, so it, it's not a direct address insult here, but the analogy would sound harsh enough. So what is it? Is Jesus ethnocentric? Is he anti-Gentile? Uh, I think rather what we have here is that Jesus is raising an obstacle because we see a pattern of this. Often there's an obstacle that tests and thus proves faith. And I think that's what Jesus is doing here. He's making an obstacle. We see other obstacles. Mark chapter 2, and this wasn't an obstacle made by Jesus, but it was an obstacle to their faith. When they couldn't get to Jesus because of the crowds, they had to do something. They tore up the roof to get the guy to Jesus. Mark chapter 5, she shouldn't have been out in this crowd bumping up against people. She definitely shouldn't have touched the hem of Jesus' garment. But she did because she was desperate. She had to have God's intervention. So uh, there are these obstacles. Jairus's daughter faces an obstacle uh, because she's dead. There's, there's nothing that Jairus can, uh, there's nothing, Jairus thinks probably there's nothing Jesus can do, but Jesus says, don't, don't worry. You still have faith. It's, it's, not, it's not too late. Uh, in Mark chapter 9, somebody, somebody comes to Jesus and says, uh, uh, if, if you're able, Jesus, what do you mean if you're able? All things are possible to the one who believes. You just need to believe. And he says, what, uh, how do I do that? <laughs> and and uh, but, but Jesus answers his request. The, the same with uh, Bartimaeus in chapter 10. The crowd says to him, stop crying out. Don't bother Jesus. He's on his way to something important. And, and Jesus says, no, call him to me. But Bartimaeus cries out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me when they're telling him to be quiet. And the point is, there are almost always obstacles to our faith. Sometimes we give up too easily. Sometimes a no is not really a no. Sometimes a no is not yet. Sometimes God is waiting to see if we're willing to hang in there and exercise faith. Now, genuine faith also has to be ready to accept if God doesn't do something, he's still worthy of our trust. But here she surmounts the obstacle that he raises before her. Uh, we, we have this kind of obstacle elsewhere in the Gospels. Um, Matthew chapter 8 and verse 7, uh, usually translated, I'll come and heal him, but probably 
the Greek should be rendered, shall I come and heal him? Like, hey, <laughs> you want me to come to a Gentile home? And, and the centurion says, no problem. You just speak the word and it'll be done. And, and so Jesus rewards his faith. Even, even with his mom, he says, when she, when she says, there's no wine, hint, hint, Jesus says, what is there between us? My hour hasn't come yet. Once I start doing this, I'm on the road to the cross. But she refuses to take no for an answer. She, she goes out, she says to the workers, uh, whatever he says to you, do it. And, and Jesus does it. And you have the, the principle elsewhere with like the persistent widow and, and so on. She passes the test. Not everybody in Mark's gospel does pass the test. I mean, you've got the rich young ruler. Jesus gives him a test for his faith. Uh, he, he invites the man to be his disciple and says, just go sell everything you have and then come follow me. Little thing. <laughs> but the, the rich ruler says, uh, no, that's too much, I'm leaving. He doesn't pass the test, but this woman passes the test. She humbles herself. She says, okay, I get it. Israel first, I understand that. But uh, uh, I understand you're comparing me to a dog. But look, thinking of pet dogs like Greeks, even the dogs under the table can eat the children's crumbs. So you're so big, even a crumb is enough for me. I mean, she really humbles herself. And she, she, she accepts Jesus' quip, and then she turns it to her advantage. And uh, Jesus rewards her persistence and her understanding. Now, I could go on to talk about healings of deaf people, because Jesus heals somebody deaf at the end of, of Mark 7, and I have examples of that today. But uh, for the sake of getting back on schedule, I'm moving to Mark chapter 8. And I'm only going to briefly mention the first 10 verses. I'm actually going to skip a bunch of stuff in Mark chapter 8, too. Maybe I'm skipping too much, but... Um, in, in, in Mark chapter 6, Jesus feeds 5,000. In Mark chapter 8, Jesus feeds 4,000. And it might seem like deja vu because, you know, a lot of things are being repeated. But the point of the repetition is the disciples didn't get it the first time. They're still having to, to get it. So in, in uh, chapter 6, Jesus answered them, you give them something to eat. And they say, what, are we going to go buy 200, 200 days wages worth of bread and give it to them to eat? So here also, the disciples replied, how can anybody feed these people with bread here in the desert? Like, they're forgetting he did this before. And then uh, Jesus says, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Well, in chapter 8, he says, how many loaves do you have? <laughs> So uh, the first time they have five loaves and two fish. The second time they have seven loaves. And he orders them to get all the people to sit down. And he orders the, them to sit down in this passage too. So you might think the disciples would understand. But in both cases, they don't get it. Mark chapter 6, verse 52. Uh, Jesus comes walking on the water. and they're shocked because they don't understand who he is because they didn't understand about the loaves because their hearts were hardened. Mark chapter 8, uh, they have forgotten to take bread with them in the boat. And Jesus says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. And they're like, uh-oh, it's because we didn't bring bread. And Jesus is like, wait a minute, you think I can't provide bread? You think I can't multiply this one loaf you've got? And so he sort of lays into them. I mean, he's been so patient. But at this point, it's time for them to get a reality check because they're going to they're gonna have to take over. When, when he leaves, these are the ones he's commissioned. Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000... How many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, 12. 
and the seven for the 4,000. How many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, seven. K keep in mind that the leftovers are more than the food they started with. I mean, that takes a miracle, right? Then he said to them, do you not yet understand? In English, we'd say, duh. But, but then, you know, think of Israel in the wilderness when God provided the manna every day and they didn't, they didn't get it. We think of us sometimes. God has done miracles. And instead of looking back on those special times, well, we didn't have one a day, so we forget about it. But we need to remember the things God has done so we can, we can understand. When he speaks of small fish, these are probably sardines. Um, during uh, certain seasons, these were uh, easy to get a hold of. So they have leftovers. The leftovers are, are more than they started with. This is heavenly math. This isn't something that would happen just on its own. Well, after Jesus does this really huge sign of feeding 4,000 people in the wilderness, you know, and most of the villages around would only have like maybe 200 people, no way they could provide food for everybody from these surrounding villages, but Jesus does it. He's a great host. The Pharisees come to him and they say, okay, uh, if we're going to believe in you, we need a sign. Now, what has Jesus just done? I mean, and feeding a multitude in the wilderness, what does that remind us of? Like Moses feeding God's people in the wilderness or Elisha multiplying food. But the Pharisees are like, no, no, we, we need a specific sign. We need a sign from, from heaven. Uh, it might mean just a sign from God, but they may be asking for a cosmic sign. In any case, they're not paying attention to the signs he's already given. They want to dictate what kind of signs that he will give. And you have that with a lot of skeptics today. You know, I, I thought, you know, if I can provide evidence that people have been raised from the dead in Jesus' name, people would believe. But no, I, I've, got, I've had skeptics tell me even if they saw that in front of them, they wouldn't believe. And they, they want to dictate what kind of signs God is going to have to give. You know, write it in the sky, my name. If, if, if God wrote it in the sky with their name, they'd probably say, oh, my spouse paid somebody to do that. God isn't obligated to jump through our hoops. And he gives, he gives signs, but when people aren't willing to accept the signs that he gives, it's on them. He wants faith. He's not like, you know, there to, to jump to it for whatever we, whatever we ask. Uh, so they say, oh, we forgot to bring bread. Teachers sometimes delegated to their students the responsibility for buying food for their school and so on. Uh, there's just one loaf in the, in the boat. Uh, it, it might be from the earlier miracle. We don't know. If it is from the earlier miracle, it might, there might not be a little stale, but uh, it was food. But they forgot to bring bread. And, and you know, forgetting to do things, I can't really point the finger at anybody because us professors sometimes are known to be absent-minded. Um, Medine, uh, I think you're, you're here on this Bible study. Maybe you can identify with the spouse of the professor, though you're a professor yourself, who's, who said, I, I never forget my wife's anniversary, even though I usually forget my own. Um, you know, just sometimes we, we are absent-minded, right? So, Jesus tells them, beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. Leaven is, is basically something like what we call yeast today. And, and he, he words it in Greek, it's a double warning. See to it that you watch out. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's see twice, you know, look, see here. Yeast, sometimes it's a symbol of something bad in scripture. Sometimes it's a symbol of something good in scripture. Sometimes it's just a symbol for haste, like with the Exodus. But basically, yeast usually represents whatever spreads or grows, good or bad. In this case, it's bad, the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod. What is 
the, the, the yeast of the Pharisees. Well, you look back at what the Pharisees were just doing, it's an expression of unbelief. The, the uh, Pharisees were like, oh, we'll believe you if you play by our rules. That's unbelief. And then you have the yeast of Herod. Well, what has Herod been doing? Well, if you go back to chapter six, he just killed John the Baptist. So watch out for the political elites who might do you in, he's saying to them. Or, or maybe he's talking with the Herodians who work with the Pharisees together to, to do Jesus in. But the disciples misunderstand. Sometimes they take Jesus' literal language too figuratively. So Jesus is talking about the rising from the dead in chapter 9. And they're like, hmm, what could that mean? Sometimes they take his figurative language too literally. Oh, the leaven of the Pharisees and of Herod, it's because we have no bread. So uh, we aren't the first generation for some people to misunderstand Jesus' teaching. It's been going on for a long time. Jesus reproves them for their spiritual dull wittedness. And he says it like five different ways. You still don't perceive or understand. Your heart's still hardened. You have eyes and fail to see. You have ears you fail to hear. That sounds a lot like what he said about outsiders back in chapter four in the parables. He said, you know, those who are outside, they get everything in parables. They don't, they don't see, they don't understand. Now he's saying it to his own inner circle. They, they still don't get it. They still don't understand his identity. And then uh, the sixth one, you still don't understand. One gets the impression that they weren't catching something. Uh, at this point, the repetition is more than playful banter. Their, their focus is wrong. And they're worried about physical bread. He can take care of the physical bread. He's with them. Instead, they need to avoid the unbelief of the Pharisees. And they do exactly the opposite. They're unbelieving when, with Jesus. Now, some of us can have some sympathy for them because, again, sometimes we don't get it either. We don't uh, embrace his message with full faith. So moving on to the blind man of Bethsaida. Jesus is about to heal a blind man. And the distinctive element in this healing, as opposed to some of the other healings in the gospel, is this one happens in two stages. Now, there are other places where you sort of may have two stages. Um, back when he commands legion, he has to command the, the uh, legion more than once. And in Mark chapter 9, he rebukes the unclean spirit, casts it out, then the, the boy is like dead. He takes the boy from with the hand and raises him. So that may be two stages. Uh, also the, the fig tree, he curses it instead of it withering at once. You know, they come back the next day and find it withered. Matthew, you know, uh, squishes those, those things together. Uh, Matthew is very orderly, likes to put things together that belong together. But um, sometimes you have something like two stages, but this one is like really distinctively two stages. And there's a reason I think for that. Um, the, the blind man sees movement, but his brain isn't ready to process it yet. He's been blind too long. His brain isn't used to processing images. I mean, like a baby, they have to learn how to, to use the images. Uh, and, and we also have that in medical restorations of sight where sometimes, you know, it's like, whoa, there are all these visual stimuli and the person is overwhelmed by it because they don't know what to do with it. That happened with Andrea Anderson, who was healed of blindness uh, miraculously, but it took her a while. She couldn't go into a grocery store because all the visual stimuli just give her a headache. But there's also a figurative point in the context. Jesus is giving something like an acted parable. What has he just called the disciples? He said, Are you, do you have eyes, but you don't see? The disciples see, but they don't understand. They're not as blind as the outsiders back in chapter four, but they still need, like this man, they still need a second touch to fully see. And I think Jesus demonstrates this so they can 
recognize, okay, we still need a second touch. Well, soon after this, Peter is going to confess Jesus as the Messiah. Ah, he's got it right. <laughs> it takes halfway through the gospel for the disciples to get it, right? But he still doesn't have it quite right because he thinks the Messiah is not going to suffer and gets called Satan in the process. He still needs the second touch. So we're going we're gonna to go on to that. Uh, here are some disciples who look like trees walking around, right? <laughs> uh, here they look a little bit clearer. Uh, this is a picture of Andrea Anderson, whom I interviewed, uh, and a picture of uh, when she was healed, when somebody prayed for her. She'd been blind for 12 years, and she was instantly and completely healed when she was prayed for. And I can give you a lot of other examples of, of this. Um, Wendy Dykeman wasn't blind. Uh, she's a professor at United Theological Seminary. This is Anderson Park. Um, and they, uh, they witnessed blind, a blind person being healed in a village in Mozambique. And the next day, this village that had no church, the church was started there because people realized, whoa, Jesus is powerful. So I could give you a lot more examples of that, but I'm gonna go on to the, the heart of this. This is kind of the, the center of the, of the gospel of Mark, because finally Jesus, I mean, they already suspected it, I think, but finally Jesus, one of Jesus' disciples confesses that Jesus is the Messiah. They're halfway there. Peter's confession and his satanic misunderstanding of what that means. Now this happens at Caesarea Philippi. They're in Gentile territory again. There were Jewish people who lived there, but it was predominantly Gentile territory. In fact, uh, there's a big cave of the god Pan there. This is remains from the synagogue. There were Jewish people who lived there. But <clears throat> the, the cave that was uh, sacred to the Gentiles there was a cave for the worship of the rural god Pan. Uh, and uh, it also was known for witchcraft. Uh, later Christians exercised it to cast out the demons from it, but it was, uh, this is a really pagan area. There's also emperor cult there, the worship of the emperor. So Jesus puts the question to them, will you marry me? No. Um, I, I've, I asked that to Medine multiple, multiple, multiple times. She can fill you in on that. But uh, who do people say that I am? Jesus' identity is the big question of preceding chapters. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And who then is this that even the wind and the, and the sea obey him? Wait, isn't this the carpenter? Or in, in, in chapter six, uh, who, who do people say that I am? And they give uh, answers from the you know, different kinds of prophets. In the same way, uh, the supernatural beings all know the answer. The demons know who he is. God, the father knows who he is, obviously. Uh, they confess that Jesus is God's son. But other people throughout the narrative are like, we're trying to figure out who he is. Well, now Jesus asks them again, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, most people think you're a prophet, just like they answered back in chapter six. That's true. Jesus is a prophet, but Jesus is also more than a prophet. He's the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. He's the Messiah. And so Jesus says to his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the Messiah. Now this might seem like the climax, but it goes downhill from here. I mean, Matthew gives us some more detail, but you know, in Matthew, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, uh, on this rock, I'll build my church and so on. But in Mark, you know, he cuts straight to, to, to how Peter messes this up. Jesus has been keeping his secret identity secret so far, and he tells him to keep it a secret. It's not for the outsiders to know yet. And then he sternly orders them not to tell anybody about him. Uh, the, the word for sternly ordered, it's so strong, so stern, that the word actually was used for rebukes. He uses it for rebuking demons and rebuking the wind. 
and so on. So he he, he uh, tells them to, to keep it secret. Well, that fits a motif that runs through Mark's gospel. Who is Jesus in Mark's gospel? We're going to look at this point at the mystery of the Messiah, the meaning of the Messiah, and the messengers of the Messiah. Peter says, you're the Christ. Jesus says, don't tell anybody. Well, remember when Jesus healed the leper, he said, don't tell anybody. When he raised Jairus's daughter, he said, don't tell anybody. When he healed the deaf man that we skipped in chapter 7, and he healed the blind man in chapter 8, which we didn't skip, but I skipped this, uh, this verse, he said, don't tell anybody. Keep it a secret. Don't even go into the city. <laughs> so people won't ask. Jesus also spoke of the kingdom, God's God's, the way that God was bringing about his reign, like starting from a mustard seed, is a secret to outsiders. Demons knew Jesus' identity, so he always silenced them back in chapters one and three. He doesn't want it proclaimed yet. He, he doesn't want anybody to know where he goes in a retreat. That's partly to keep the paparazzi away, you know, <laughs> give his disciples a real retreat. But uh, some of this may may have been just to restrain popularity, which would lead too quickly to the cross. But remember, there's two exceptions. Jesus told a Gentile, former demoniac, to tell everybody what God had done, because Gentiles wouldn't misunderstand what it meant for Jesus to be the Messiah. They needed to be warned not to see him as a magician. That was their category. And also, Jesus said, tell nobody about the, tra well, this is after this, but tell nobody about the transfiguration until I'm risen because people wouldn't understand the nature of Jesus' Messiahship, what it meant for him to be the Messiah without the cross. And they wouldn't understand the true meaning of the cross without the resurrection. You have different levels of misunderstanding. Jesus' opponents are blind. Disciples have unbelief. Jesus calls them blind, but they're not as blind as the Pharisees. They needed a second touch just like we saw in the acted parable right after he calls them blind. Um, the disciples are still half blind, but they'll get the second touch. And so the meaning of the Messiah, Peter says, you're the Christ. Jesus then explains what it means for him to be the Christ. He's going to suffer. He's going to die. Peter objects to that. So Jesus says, you're Satan. Because you value human things and human perspectives more than God's things. They needed to understand the cross and they needed to understand the resurrection. It's not enough to believe Jesus is a great teacher, a prophet, or even the Messiah. You know, plenty of people believe Jesus was a, a great man or a great teacher. I mean, historically, how could you deny he's a great teacher? Certainly has a, has a great following a prophet, but it's not even enough to confess he's the Messiah. Um, there, there's a huge major world religion that's very respectful to Jesus, more respectful than secular thought. I mean, Jesus was born of a virgin. Jesus is a great prophet, one of the greatest, did miracles and all that. But we have to believe he died for us to be saved. <clears throat> so the ministers of the Messiah, Jesus says, I'll suffer. Peter says, no, you won't. No, don't get discouraged. Jesus calls this anti-suffering theology satanic. Do we have anti-suffering theology today? And Peter says, if you want to follow me, I'm going to the cross. You want to follow me? You're going to follow to the cross. My followers must also suffer. Well, now we know why Peter wasn't really happy about this suffering theology. Our fate is bound up with his. Jesus faces increasing opposition in chapters two and three. The disciples remain oblivious, sends out the disciples to heal in chapter six, but they're, they're being sent out and they're coming back frames a very large section about John the Baptist's martyrdom. John the Baptist, Jesus' forerunner. The disciples, well, 
the crowds try to keep away Bartimaeus, the disciples tried to keep away children. And so Jesus gives them an example. I came to serve and to die, and I'm an example for you. Jesus in chapter 13 warns of great tribulation for his followers and then goes to the cross in chapters 14 and 15. We need to preach the gospel straight. True followers share Jesus' cross. He bore God's judgment for us, but we have to be ready to bear the world's hatred with him. So Jesus gives a passion prediction. He began to teach that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, all the, the big people, and be killed, and after three days, rise again. He gives this again in chapter 9. He gives it again in chapter 10. And after each of these passion predictions, the disciples, they change the subject. Uh, Peter Peter doesn't want to believe the, the first passion prediction. Uh, he, in, in chapter 9, uh, they end up arguing who's the greatest. And in chapter 10, well, James and John come to him and say, oh, by the way, we want to be greatest. They're not getting it. Jesus is the son of man. That goes back to Daniel chapter 7. Uh, son of man can just mean human being. But in Daniel 7, you've got the four kingdoms represented by four beasts, four, four kings represented by four beasts, and then the final kingdom, the kingdom of God, represented by one like a son of man, who's to rule and be worshipped, and also identifies with God's people, the saints who suffer and then are exalted. Jesus is finally speaking openly. Finally, his disciples express some understanding so now Jesus goes on to explain about his mission. The first half of the gospel climaxes with recognizing Jesus as the Messiah. The second half of the gospel, what comes after tonight, will define Jesus' Messiahship in terms of the cross. Peter doesn't get it, but I think sometimes we are reluctant to get it too, because we want, we want the kingdom in its fullness now. We don't want to have to go through suffering in this world. But suffering is part of our destiny with him. If we are willing to lay down our lives, though, we have the promise of eternal life. So Peter's ideology made sense in light of his culture. People were expecting a Messiah to be victorious, not to die. And surely the leaders of their people would welcome this Messiah <laughs> rather than view him as competition. But rebukes dominate these verses. Jesus sternly ordered, well, it's, it's the same word for rebuke, not to tell anybody about him. Peter takes Jesus aside and rebukes Jesus. Say, no, no, it won't be like that. You can't rebuke your teacher. That was totally against protocol back then. Not to mention his teacher is actually the Messiah. But, you know, he, at least he takes him aside privately. But then Jesus turns, looking at all of his disciples. So in front of all the rest of the disciples, publicly rebukes Peter. And not just any rebuke, but as Satan. So we really need to, uh, yeah, get, get behind me. That was the proper posture for disciple. They were supposed to follow their teacher. Jesus called people to follow. Getting behind him means following. And uh, next week, when we pick up, we'll see what this means to take up the cross and follow Jesus. And with that, uh, I think my time is up. And so we will come back to uh, Ranjo and questions. And never promise answers, but questions anyway. Thanks so much, Craig. Hey, Dwight is going to uh, lead our time of discussion tonight. Thanks. So, Dwight, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you. Thanks. Now, um, I've just been looking at the chat. Uh, some interesting oh, good. discussions in the chat In the chat there. Uh, Craig, maybe if you can take a look at some of that. Uh, 
you know, there's, there's a question about, do you think the Bible proves that God is real? And it's a complicated question. It's just an open question to all of us, I think. And then I think the Holy Spirit, uh, Phil tries to answer that. Craig, what do you think of that? Okay. Give us any thoughts on that. Starting with the first one, God gives us all sorts of proof that he's real. Uh, but not everybody is willing to accept the proof. They um, Sometimes they say, well, that's not the proof I want. I want this proof. And so we have to be willing to look at the, at the right place. We're probably not going to find him writing on the sky saying, I'm God until Jesus comes back, but then it's kind of late to, <laughs> to make up one's mind. But he's, he's given us evidence, plenty of evidence, including in the Bible. And so if we're willing, well, we've heard about the Bible, let's, let's look at it. Uh, the Bible wasn't written according to the standards that people, like today, they want scientific formulas or something like that sometimes or they want history to be written the way it's written today. It was written the way history was written back then rather than the way it's written today. But there's so much of it that we can provide evidence for. I'm actually teaching a whole course this semester on historical Jesus. And I mean, the stuff has to go back to the earliest witnesses. Just to give one example of that, um, that is uh, Bethsaida that appears in the gospels. Bethsaida was renamed Julius around the year 30, but the Gospels only use the name that it had before, uh, which shows that this, these are the memories of Galilean followers of Jesus who, who are remembering the things from that time, from around the year 30 when Jesus was doing ministry. Got so much evidence for, for Jesus' resurrection, uh, including I mean, eyewitnesses, Paul was a persecutor of the church, became an eyewitness, and um, he reports a whole bunch of other eyewitnesses that go back right to the very beginning. And he's reporting all this just a couple decades after, after the event. I mean, for first century history, we, we very rarely have things that are documented that close to the, to the sources. Uh, today, people say, oh, well, that's, that's just what the Bible says. That's, that's, that's the Bible. It's biased. Look, Paul was, Paul was a persecutor of Christians. It's in the Bible now, but before it was in the Bible, it was a letter that he wrote to people who could go check it out. So, I mean, those are just a couple samples, but just to say uh, God provides plenty of evidence, but people need to be willing to look where he gave the evidence and not say, okay, well, I want, I want you to write on the wall. He wrote on, on the wall in Daniel, but he doesn't do that for everybody all the time. And then the second question. Uh, maybe uh, is that about uh, the disciples, what they were thinking when Peter made his proclamation. I think that's more of uh, conjecture really, but I don't know if you want to say anything on that. But the third one, is comparison to rapture being escapism from suffering. <laughs> I don't have an opportunity yet, an opinion yet, but curious tonight. Okay. Well, oh. I wrote a book on that. <laughs> um, I mean, I think that the, well, it wasn't, it didn't originally start that way, but the idea of a rapture before the tribulation became very common because of that, because of escapism. Um, it's first documented, or at least first circulated widely around the year 1830, the idea of a rapture before the tribulation. Up until then, everybody believed that our catching up would happen at the second coming when Jesus came back at the very end of the age. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that's what the Bible teaches, just that it's, it all happens at once. When Jesus comes back at the end of the age, we're caught up to meet him in the air. Uh, so yes, I think that's often used as, as escapism. Okay. Margaret, did you have something you wanted to say? Yes. Okay. The question to ask, I've been debating it with my family and my dad. <laughs> my dad's like, no, the Bible proves, no, 
the Bible is something we believe in. It doesn't prove that God is real. And he was like, well, that means um, Buddhism and all that, like that proves that that is real too. And I was like, no, no, it doesn't. And I was like, I need to get some more information to back myself up. But <laughs> yeah, what do you, what do you have to say? About the, the, the Bible gives us lots of evidence. Well, if I'm understanding the question right, if I'm not, please feel free to, um, to yeah, make me cl cl clarify for me. But um, the Bible gives a lot of claims that can be tested historically, pr provided we take it in the context in which it's written. So like with Genesis 1, you don't want to, you know, the days are a schematic device. They're not meant the, the Hebrew word yom is used three different ways. The Hebrew word translated day is used three different ways in Genesis 1, 1, 2, 2, 3. Uh, so even there in the creation narrative, it's, it's not telling us literal 24 hour days, um, but uh, the idea that the universe had a beginning, well, <laughs> the idea that it goes from le less complex to more complex, well, <laughs> um, but but it was it was in an ancient Near Eastern context that was responding to polytheism, you know, where this god was fighting that god and and so on. Um, it, but then with when you come to the historical claims, there's some of them we have no evidence we can't test. But there are plenty of them that we do have evidence and we can test. Now the evidence, the further back you go, the less complete there is evidence available. But the closer we come to our time, the usually the more evidence that's available. And for the New Testament, like there's lots of evidence available. Uh, so I would say, yeah, let's look at the evidence. You don't usually have, I don't know of any other religion where you have uh, the documents from witnesses, or at least many of them being witnesses from within living memory of the founder of the religion that also attest miracles. And in the, case of, in the case of Jesus, I mean, you have lots of witnesses who claim that they saw Jesus alive from the dead. And this is all from within living memory. So uh, when I say living memory uh, in, in oral historiography, living memory is the period when the eyewitnesses are still alive or those who knew them are still alive. And uh, yeah, I just, I, I wrote a book. Uh, I would grab it and show it to you, but a bunch of other books on top of it would fall off. Um, but I, I wrote a book uh, about, about the reliability of the gospels. Uh, it's like uh, 800 pages, I think. Uh, but And there are also other books that are more accessible. Lee Strobel has written a lot, uh, very well informed, but more readable than most of mine. And uh, But I, I also could uh, give you, you know, let you know some other books. One, one in New Testament is uh, by F.F. F. Bruce, the New Testament documents, are they reliable? Um, Edwin Yamauchi had one called The Stones in the Scriptures. I don't know if it's still in print, but yeah. Uh, Hugh Ross does a lot of stuff on astrophysics and and the Bible and, and, and so forth. There's there's a lot of good good stuff there. That's good. Yeah. There's um there's a comment here. Uh, I don't know if you wanna actually speak, Mike and Katie. Maybe you wanna talk and just share what you've put on the com on, on the chat. I just want to remind you all that um, this is being recorded. So when you speak, you will end up on the recording. So if you don't want to be um, on the recording, then you're welcome to type it. Okay. You're all famous. Um, sure. I'm, I, I don't mind speaking about that. Margaret, I'm, I'm Katie. Sorry. I used to be a chemistry and physics high school teacher before I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, and for me, when I was studying chemistry and atoms and electrons and even just the basic building blocks of everything, like the way... Um, electrons fit together. All electrons have a negative charge, right? And negative charges repel, right? So you shouldn't be able to have more than two electrons in an atom because they would just blow apart. Like our atoms couldn't exist. 
but the way God put it together and Job actually references like God forming patterns of the universe, like the book of the Bible actually references patterns of the universe that God formed. Um, like electrons fit together because two of them go in a circle and then two of them go in shapes like this. And then two of them go in even tinier patterns around that. And two more go in even tinier patterns around that. And you can put them all together, stack them on top of each other in this gorgeous like flower pattern design so that you can get like 60 and 80 and 100 electrons in a stable atom and they whiz around each other as fast as like, like faster than the speed of light. And they still don't run into each other because God made these very specific patterns for electrons to move in. And so when I was studying that and I looked at that, I was like, there, like, there has to be a creator. Like this can't happen by accident. Like somebody wrote the patterns of the universe with into this atom. And from that, like, okay, if this creator of the universe cares so much about an atom that is so small, like you can't even see it with a microscope, like how much more will he cares about, care about me, somebody he created? And if he cares about me enough that he would create my atoms to stay within perfect alignment to each other, then he had to do something about my sin. What did he do about my sin? Jesus. And so, like, I started with those basic building blocks of life, and that's how I ended up at Jesus. Like, and that's why I became a chemistry teacher, so that I could inspire other people to love Jesus the same way. So, I, I, I hope that helps. <laughs> I know it's not a very theological answer, but my background oh, yeah. is science, so that's, that's yeah. what I go to. <laughs> I mean, we need, yeah, uh, be, before everything became so specialized, the... Uh, natural scientists were theologians and, and vice versa. So, um, but yeah, I mean, the parameters necessary for life to exist, uh, having, having, you know, the uh, basically a neutral electrical charge in the whole universe, having the, the right mass for the universe, having um, the, the force of gravity being just right. And, you know, all these different forces, uh, all these different constants for, um, stars to form and then uh, heavier substances, planets to form and for amino acids to form and all these things. I mean, the odds of all that happening by accident, I don't know, it's like, I don't know, 10 to the 10,000 power. I, it, it's, uh, that's not the correct number, but it's just inconceivable that, that that's an accident. That's, uh, so, so a lot of people, uh, have worked on that, some in the intelligent design movement, um, which has uh, been more widely accepted philosophically in physics than, than in biology. But um, anyway, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of stuff there. So um, yeah, this was an awesome discussion. Thank you for that question. And uh, thanks for everyone who participated in that. This, is, this was so good. Um, let me say a quick prayer. And I'm going to close and um, give you guys some space to break out into groups. So, Father, thank you that uh, thank you that you are real. We acknowledge that you exist and that uh, you are God in the truest sense. The Alpha, the Omega, the Creator, and the one worthy and the only one worthy of all praise and honor and glory. We worship you. Uh, we pray your blessing over this um, this teaching and the discussion today, Lord, we pray that you would um, make yourself more, make us more aware of who you are, more aware of your presence, more aware of um, who, you're, who you're making us and teach us how to live in connection with you. We pray that uh, you would continue this work as people join in their groups now. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.